Alice Drager. I'm the founder and executive director and publisher of East Lansing Info, and we appreciate you all coming today. We're going to do a primer on FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, and we're also going to uh, give you some stories about things that we've done with FOIA and take your questions and possibly your stories if you want to share them. So right now we're just going to go around and hear from folks who work for Eli, just so they can introduce themselves real quick and then we'll launch into the PowerPoint. Andrew, do you want to start us? Sure. Um, I'm Andrew Graham. Hello, everybody. I'm Eli's City Desk editor since, I believe, September at some point, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm 22 years old. I'm currently living in my childhood bedroom at my parents' house until I can get the Moderna vaccine or something. Um, but so far, I'm just sort of handling the city beat, doing a lot of city coverage and sort of other enterprise stuff from there, and hopefully doing more sports stuff in the near future. Great. I'm just going in order of people that I see people on the list. Cody, want to introduce yourself? Hi there, my name is Cody Harrell, and I am the journalism instructor and yearbook and newspaper advisor at East Lansing High School, and I am the director of the Summer Youth Journalism Program with East Lansing Info. Um, my whole life revolves around teaching young people how the world journalism affects them, but also the role that they play. Uh, and I'm just excited to be here and be able to talk to all of you and provide anything that I can. I can also talk forever, but you don't need that. Um, and yeah, and uh, I've got your book spreads literally sitting here right in front of me. So that's how you know that uh, the world of journalism is good and that the kids are doing amazing. So thank you. Mesa? Hi, I'm Mesa um, and I sit on Eli's board. You're the secretary of our board of directors. Yes, right. Um, and I'm also a college student. And a member of our community advisory board. Emily? Hi, I'm Emily. I started reporting with Eli in January, and then I was um, promoted to managing editor in October. Great. Jody. Hi, everyone. So my uh, profile picture is actually the East Lansing Info QR code um, today for tonight. But um, I'm the general manager for Eli, and I've been in that role for over two years now. Um, I kind of run the day-to-day -day activities and also um, am in charge of sort of managing the behind the scenes work of our sustainability and fundraising campaign. Thank you. Nathan? <laughs> I am Nathan Andrus. I'm the chief data analyst. I have been doing this for about a month officially, but uh, back into maybe April or so unofficially. Um, fun fact about me, uh, prior to coming here, I was working uh, with the, the city of East Lansing for a while. So was there for about two years. Great. Chris, I don't know if you're here as an Eli person or learning stuff, but go ahead. <laughs> Probably both. Um, I've been a reporter since the beginning of Eli, but I'm not doing much reporting now. I do do some editing of government articles. And uh, I'm the mother of a former co-editor of the um, yearbook at East Lansing High School. So I have that connection to Cody. That was Very a long cool. time ago, though. And I've done some FOIA. Nice, thank you. And I just want to recognize that we have two more members of our community advisory board with us tonight, Ann Hill and Thassan Sadar. So thank you for being with us. So I'm going to launch into this uh, PowerPoint that I put together just to tell you a little bit about how FOIA works. So let's start doing that. Can everybody see that okay? The fun with FOIA. Yep. yep. Okay, good. great. So brought to you by the Eli team tonight. And what is the Freedom of Information Act? The Freedom of Information Act is part of an open government system in the United States that exists federally, but also at the state levels. And it allows you to have access to what your government is doing, at least in theory. So what kinds of requests, who can you make FOIA requests of? Basically any public agency should have a means by which you can send in a Freedom of Information Act request or a FOIA request. That includes City of East Lansing, East Lansing Public Schools, the East Lansing Police Department, the East Lansing Fire Department, CATA, state agencies and federal agencies. So some of them take a lot longer than others. The bigger the organization, chances are the longer it will take. Federal agencies can take years to actually answer FOIAs. A few years ago, the New York Times did a piece about an FDA FOIA that they got back after 11 years. So that's how long it can take. If you happen to have read my book, Galileo's Middle Finger, you'll know that the last third of that book is actually based mostly on Freedom of Information Act requests to the um, FDA and to the Office of Human Research Protections. And those were only obtained after I sued the federal government and 
um, basically won the case simply by uh, having my rights respected. There was really no case because they owed me the stuff and they just didn't give it to me. So what can you get in FOIA? There's all sorts of things that you can get in FOIA. They include, whoops, for example, any records that exist. So you can't get something through FOIA that doesn't exist. So if there was an oral conversation and there's no recording of it, you can't get it. But if there is a recording of it, you actually can request it. You can get letters, emails, calendars. So you can FOIA the city manager's calendar if you want to. Photographs, maps, phone records, accounting registers, property reg records. Say you're thinking of buying a property, you can FOIA all the information available from the city about that property. They may not have it a lot, but you can find out what they do have. Notes that were kept from meetings and other people's FOIAs. And that's one of the fun ones that Eli does. We look at what other people are FOIA and then we ask uh, or we take a look at what they've found so that we can also benefit from what they asked about. Some material can be withheld from you, and I'm not gonna get into all the exemptions that are allowed under FOIA because that's kind of a higher level of FOIA explanation. But if they have withheld information from you, they're supposed to tell you they're withholding material and tell you under what exemption it's being held. So just some examples of the kinds of things that can be withheld is direct attorney client privileged information. That's actually a fairly narrow thing. It's when the attorney is giving their client specific information, but the city of East Lansing has used that exemption to withhold a lot more um, than they really are allowed to. We've appealed successfully on that. They can also withhold um, personal medical information if it happens to appear in a public document. Those are the kinds of things they can withhold, but a lot of things actually can be obtained through FOIA. So these are just three recent examples of articles that came at Eli through FOIA requests. The first one up in the top left is cooped up inside. It's about chickens in the city of East Lansing. This one happened because we were looking through the FOIA log and noticed that somebody else had FOIA this information. And we thought, wow, that's kind of cool stuff this person got back. And so Heather Brothers took that information for us and then talked to um, a person who's a supporter of Eli who actually has chickens herself and then did an article out of it. The one in the middle was a piece done by Andrew Graham using information that he FOIA'd about Harbor Bay's persistent efforts to change the deal with the Newman Lofts uh, 55 plus housing. The third one by Emily was about parking enforcement um, in the city of East Lansing, looking at how much the city of East Lansing makes on parking tickets and how much that's gone down. So these are all examples of the kinds of work that we do using Freedom of Information Act. But a lot of the stories we do, you never even will notice that we're using it because it's happening kind of in the background. These are some examples of things that I've worked on in terms of FOIA. So the first one on the top is a record from a closing statement from the Center City District Bond. The original bond allowed me to see who got paid out of the bond. Uh, the second piece has to do with the city attorney's retaining wall. I, I think it's fair to call it a scandal. Um, that allowed me to see that the city attorney did not disclose that he was the owner of the property where the retaining wall was um, <clears throat> in existence when the city council was being asked to grant easements. The third one was a fun one that brought, was brought to us by Mark Grebner, who's a local uh, political consultant. And Mark was interested in looking at the ballots from the last city council meeting, uh, city council race, and looking to see, because Meadows and Altman were so close in the race, was it possible that if there was a recount, Altman would have won? And so this was just an example from one of the ballots I took a picture of that shows you somebody who incorrectly filled in the ballot. You can see they did check marks instead of doing the circular thing. And that may have caused the machine reader to read it incorrectly. So we did a whole analysis based on what was in those, um, those ballots. So you can actually FOIA ballots. They don't have people, the voters' names on it, of course. There's no identification, but you can look at the ballots themselves. So some FOIAs, do's and don'ts, just to get into some of what we've learned. Do ask the right agency. So in other words, you don't want to ask the East Lansing Public Schools for information about policing. But it may be the case that if you're interested in police officers being at the public schools, you're going to FOIA both of them to try to approach it from both angles. Secondly, be very clear. There's some language we can help you with, and we're always happy to help you word your FOIA or put your FOIA in for you if you want coverage. If you don't want somebody to know that you're the person seeking the information, we will file it for you. I've done that for lots of people. You should be very clear saying things like any and all communications between so and so and so and so, or including but not limited to emails and letters, so they're clear that you're looking for everything. Be specific about what you're looking for in order to avoid delays and expenses. So give a start and an end date, for example, to what you're looking for. So if you're looking to figure out how much is the city of East Lansing brought in in terms of parking tickets, you have to ask over a particular period of time. You don't want to ask forever or it's going to take forever to get it back and they're going to charge you money. So what should you not do? 
Don't be afraid to assert your rights. Don't be afraid to say, I really think I'm owed this under FOIA. Don't be afraid to ask to inspect documents rather than getting copies. So the Freedom of Information Act law in Michigan allows you the right to ask to inspect documents. If the city has to make photocopies of something that say very long or very large, imagine if they had to photocopy lots and lots of material, that might they might charge you a lot of money because they can charge you for those copies. But you can ask for the right, at least when there's not a pandemic, to go in and actually look at the documents yourself. And that gives you the opportunity to find the actual documents you're specifically interested in and take photos of those specifically. That allows you to avoid expense. Don't ask for crazy huge amounts of material all at once or you're gonna run into um, charges as well as uh, delays. And don't accept responses that leave it unclear whether they've given you everything you're owed. So if the answer comes back and it's vague as to what they might be withholding, go ahead and press and ask and find out. And if you need to appeal, file an appeal, you can do that with whomever you're asking for. They have to deal with your appeal. It may take a little bit longer, but you have the right to do that. And you don't need an attorney to do that. You just need to make an argument that you may have had something withheld that should not have been withheld. So this is a screenshot showing you real quickly what it looks like when you go to the City of East Lansing's FOIA page. There's a FOIA log that we've been talking about where you can actually look at what other people have been um, requesting. And then there's a tracking system called the Just FOIA Tracking System, which is an outside um, consultant group that basically runs this for the city, runs it for a whole bunch of different agencies. But it allows you to go to an online request form. But notice also that it offers you the opportunity to call the East Lansing clerk's office or email them and ask them a question. Before you file a FOIA, it's never a bad idea to give a call and say, this is what I'm interested in. Can you give me any thoughts on how I might word this? They're really helpful people, so they, they're happy to help you with that kind of stuff. If you click on the form and do it online, this is the form you're gonna find. You put in your name, you say on behalf of, if it's on behalf of somebody, so we put in on behalf of East Lansing Info, your phone number, your email address, your address, city, state, zip, and then you make the request. It's really simple. You can add attachments if there's something specifically you're referring to. The thing to know is that all your personal information on this will become publicly visible. So if you don't want your phone number known, if you don't want your name out there, then ask us to file a FOIA for you and we will do that. It, as long as it doesn't cost anything, which on the first pass it never does, we're happy to do that and then you can kind of take it from there. Although if you have to make an appeal, then you may have to do it in your own name and then do the appeal. So that's kind of the uh, rundown. This is East Lansing Info's website, in case you're not familiar with it, it's at eastlansinginfo.news. It provides news and information to the people of East Lansing, and I just wanna point out a couple of things. On the right side, you'll see lots of ways to stay in touch with us. So you can get our email newsletters, you can like us on Facebook and then follow us that way, follow us on Twitter or subscribe to an RSS feed. We also have a, a campaign going right now that allows us matching dollars, so we've got news match through the end of the year. So if you donate now to help us in our 2021 sustainability campaign, <clears throat> we can get matching dollars for your donation. So that's this code that Jody has up as her profile picture. And if you point your camera to that, you actually can immediately um, go to an app and donate money to us. But it's also really easy just to go to East Lansing Info's website and you'll very easily figure out how you can donate. There's buttons all over the place that tell you how to donate. So that's sort of my rundown. And now I'm gonna ask, um, our folks to give a little bit of stories about what they've FOIA'd in terms of their own experiences. So Emily, do you wanna go first, our managing editor? Sure, um, well, I have a FOIA story coming out tomorrow morning, so I won't give spoiler alerts, but I recommend going to eastlansinginfo.news in the morning, and I think you'll enjoy the article. Um, we were asked to choose one article and it, uh, that we wanted to talk about, and it was hard to choose just one. Um, the one that I en enjoy maybe is a strange word, but the one that I think was maybe the most important research that I did was looking at demographics and employment in the city of East Lansing. And Alice got the documents and I... And we combed through it. And on the surface, everything looked pretty good for employment with the city of East Lansing. I think um, according to census data from 2014, 7.4, 7.8% of the city is African American or black, 7 point something is Hispanic Latino, and the city workplace employment matched that almost perfectly to the point it was creepy that, <laughs> it was odd that it matched so perfectly, but when Nathan and I dug deeper, 
there was huge disparities in where people were employed. So the top 10 highest earners, there was only, I think, two or three women in there. One, one woman. One. Um, then there was also the issue that uh, people of color were primarily in part-time employment. So they were seasonal workers working for Parks and Rec, and they weren't full-time employees, and they weren't earning um, as much money then as their counterparts. So that, to me, had the biggest, maybe, I don't know what impact it had, but I thought that was the most important work. And then a fun one was working on cars for the city of East Lansing. Well, we've done a follow-up on your demographic one to figure out whether or not we may have had an effect by bringing the demographic information forward, because one thing I've noticed is that it seems like a lot of women in the city of East Lansing are suddenly being promoted, and I'm curious to see if we can demonstrate that after Eli's reporting on that, that women are getting promotions and pay raises. So I'll be curious to see whether or not that in fact happened. Andrew, you want to give us one of yours? Sure. Um, I do not have as hard a time choosing unlike Emily, because mine is one of those I like to... It's the uh, the one Alice showed earlier, the the documents show Harbor Bay's persistent efforts to try and change deal, um, which I enjoyed basically because they, in I remember, I can't even remember the day anymore, but their press conference in August that Alice sent me to watch, we were kind of like, oh, what's this going to be? Like, they're probably just going to ask for something. And it ended up being more about attacking Eli than anything else. Um, but they basically, Harbor Bay's party line was that the COVID pandemic was really what was driving them to need to try and, you know, get rid of the 55 plus restriction and they wouldn't have done it if there wasn't a pandemic and so on and so forth. And after FOIAing for all of the communications between Harbor Bay representatives and elected officials and city manager and talking to Mark Meadows, basically found out that they'd been asking to get rid of the 55 plus restriction for at least a year before the development opened, which was just like a I mean, like I hesitate to use the term smoking gun because it wasn't like that surprising, but it was sort of like you have said, oh, COVID and we were, uh, we were going to rent to 55 plus and then there was a pandemic and now we can't when Mark Meadows was telling me they were asking for it in 2019. Yeah, great one. And uh, we put that together with a lot of tapes, uh, videotapes from council meetings and that sort of thing. And it made for a really great story in terms of the public facing side and the private facing side and putting together that whole timeline and showing the story. We also recorded a podcast feature about it. It's We have covered that one ad nauseum at this point. <laughs> Eli has a podcast, East Lansing Insider. So if you go to eastlansinginfo.news, you can find at the top in the top menu, the podcast link. And if you go there, you can subscribe to our podcast, which is free. Nathan, you want to give us yours? Yeah, I think one of my, and it's not anything that we've published too much on yet, but uh, one of the things that Alice has worked on um, over the last year or so is trying to figure out how much we've spent, uh, how much the city has spent on different legal cases and things like that. And so um, she had originally FOIAed some data for I think this last fiscal year to get a better understanding of uh, what the city has spent their money on in terms of legal expenses. And there was actually a FOIA request that we came across just looking through the FOIA log, which was every payment that the city made um, throughout fiscal year 2019. Uh, and we took a look at that and we saw a lot of these weird payments to small little law firms and uh, all sorts of different people. Um, and then we followed up on that and requested all of the data for 2020, which has allowed us to take a look at what the city has provided us in terms of their information. And we've been able to go through um, every payment that was made for fiscal year 2019 and 2020. And it's been interesting to see um, if the payments are matching up. Um, in some cases they are, in some cases they're not. Um, I just submitted another request, I think on Thursday or Friday to um, hopefully get more information out of the city. So uh, we'll see what comes out of that. But it's been very interesting to go through every single payment that the city's made for about two years and try and find information out of there. 
when that one came in, uh, Nathan and Emily and I hopped on it. And the, the three of us, like an hour later, came up for air because we were all on the phone together gossiping like, oh, my God, look at line such and such. What do you think they're doing with that money? Because <laughs> there was one that appeared to be a divorce law firm that the city was paying money to. <laughs> and so this led to lots of jokes about who is the city of East Lansing trying to divorce. And our theory is Meridian Township, but we're not really sure. Um, but it, there was a lot of really interesting stuff that led to lots more questions about what's where. Mm -hmm. That might have been my favorite Eli phone call of all time. Just scrolling <laughs> through and like, wow, they really spend a lot of quality dairy. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really fun phone call. I thought, oh man, we're never going to get off the phone because the three of us were just so into this checkbook register. 16, 7,000 lines in Microsoft Excel of payments that we went through. It definitely reminded me of a time when uh, my son was in high school and working for East Lansing Info after taking the summer youth journalism program with Cody and he had FOIAed some information about a political intrigue zoning story. And I happened to be on the road speaking at, I recall, Purdue University when this FOIA came in. And so I texted my son. It was first thing in the morning, but I texted my son. I said, hey, your FOIA came in. So when you get home, have a look at it. And he was in math class and he's like texting me back. Oh, my God, look at page eight. Oh, look at what they said on page 13. I'm like, pay attention in math. But that's the thing. When you get your FOIA back, sometimes it's this incredible adrenaline rush because you're seeing all this stuff that is brand new to you in, in a topic you're interested in. So, Cody, did you want to hop in there and talk a little bit about the Summer Youth Journalism Program, what you've done with FOIA? Yeah. So, we do, um, on day four of the traditional program, um, I say traditional because, of course, this past year we were all online. Um, if any of you are thinking about going into teaching, by the way, um, wait till the pandemic's over. Don't do it right now. Um, it's awful. But, uh, so, in day four of the traditional program, what we do is we actually take all the students to City Hall and we meet up with the city clerk, um, who I'm pretty sure Alice mentioned, uh, but is the person who for the city, and for the most part, is in charge of all of the, the FOIA requests. And they take us on a little tour of uh, City Hall, and we get to see all the different departments, and then talks to us a little bit about FOIA, um, does a little presentation about, you know, what they do, how the system works, how the process works, um, which actually is really great, because I think one of the things that I try to um, dispel between both first and second tier um, is the idea that a journalist doing a FOIA request is some sort of antagonistic or, you know, like some sort of act that means that you're like trying to get stuff you shouldn't have. Um, really, it's just about, you know, you're doing your job as uh, someone to, you know, make sure that things are transparent for the community. And so, you know, when you, uh, when you like send in a FOIA request, there's no one on the, on the other line being like, oh my gosh, they're making me do my job. You know, they recognize that it's like part of the democratic process. And so, um, I mean, I guess unless you do it as many times as Alice does, I, I'm sure maybe at some point they're probably getting a little tired, but um, it's a joke. Uh, you know, with, with that program, you know, it's awesome because they get to meet people like Steve Gonzalez, who handles all the FOIA requests for the police department. Um, they talk to this, uh, Jennifer Schuster, the city clerk. Um, and if you don't know, the, the FOIA coordinator at the high school is Nikki Tabor, who's uh, administrative secretary. Um, but, you know, they get to learn who the people are who are in charge of different FOIA requests. Um, and they learn as well just about, you know, making sure that uh, when they make those requests, like Allison, to be really specific, to make sure you, you know, ask for exactly everything you're looking for. But knowing, too, that, you know, it's not bad. It's actually something that, you know, uh, for a lot of people, they understand that it's about building good relationships. Um, I also, in that program, show them the different tools that are available before you go to FOIA. Um, so we go through, you know, looking through the ticket records. Um, where you can, you know, I have them look up what it's like if their parents have gotten parking tickets before, that's always really fun. Um, but, you know, places where you can get information before you have to go to a FOIA request um, and information, you know, that kind of allows them to look up, you know, property information, um, the Better Business Bureau information, stuff like that. So just public databases that also exist so that they know kind of how to, to navigate all the different streams of information. But yeah, that's, I think, what I would say if I answered the question. Yeah, and it, it's really, again, it's a really um, great way to feel like you have access to your government. I think it's a very empowering experience. For my son, the first time I had him do his own FOIA was after um, he had a strange experience in a sex ed class, and I live tweeted it, and it went viral. And then the two of us decided to be fun to see what the superintendent and the school board was saying about us. So we specifically FOIA'd their internal communications about the event. Mm -hmm. And that was really, really interesting. And it really made him feel... Like he had access to his own 
public institutions. And I think that's so important to feel like you have that access to your own public institutions. The doors are supposed to be open to you, not just in terms of public comment, but also in terms of public access to information. And so you should use it, absolutely use it all mm -hmm. the time. It's your right and it means you're invested in your own public democracy. Okay, great, that takes us to about the halfway point. Would anybody else like to share a story or ask a question? So there is a question from um, Joe, and I'm going to just ask it, and then Joe, if you want to verbally um, contribute, I'll um, unmute you. But he said, can you just ask the city to provide something without FOIA? Can the city clerks just agree to give you something, or is everything under wraps until you FOIA something? Depends whether or not you're East Lansing info. Yeah. So yes, technically you can ask for anything uh, without FOIA and you should try that first. So we do that all the time. We ask if something gets mentioned at city council by the mayor, we ask the mayor to share that thing with us. Or if um, we know that there is a issue going on with a sewer project, I'll approach or whoever's working on the story will approach the head of the Department of Public Works and ask the Department of Public Works to give us that information. And a lot of times, actually, we do get the information in a straightforward fashion. Um, but sometimes they may say to you they want you to use FOIA in order to get it. And the choice of when they make that decision is uh, flexible. Let's put it that way. It's not consistent. So you absolutely can try the front door first. And if that doesn't work, then you can try filing through the system and see if you can get it that way. My suggestion generally would be if you're in a rush, do both on the same day. And the reason is the clock starts on the day that you file the FOIA. And they have five business days to give you an initial response. And then they can, under the law, take an additional 10 business days under the claim that they need more time, which in our experience, they always do with us now. And so it's always three weeks before we can get something. So I often mark in my calendar when something's going to happen to remind myself to FOIA the next day to make sure that I'm gonna get it. You can't get something that existed after the date you FOIA'd it. So you wanna FOIA from the last date that you're interested in backwards. Um, but I, do, I often do both things at once and then if somebody is willing to give me the thing I'm looking for, I simply cancel the FOIA, which is a really super easy thing to do. You just write to the city clerk's office and you say I withdraw this FOIA because I was able to get the information another way. Super helpful. Um, so Aaron has a question and his, hand is raised. So Aaron, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure, this is fun. Um, so I actually have done a FOIA for Eli. Um, years ago, I wrote uh, Eli on Earth, and I FOIA'd the amount of natural gas going into the fireplace in downtown um, East Lansing. And um, it was... Um, it was it was cool to for the city to actually tell me that and then you could actually figure out how much that there was you know cars and cars worth of carbon coming out of that thing that didn't need to be not nearly as efficient as the yule log there on that lcd behind andrew so um uh i i, I think even just as a private citizen asking for some stuff which i've also done though usually for work um is that well look at that um that's really funny <laughs> i have a good filing system so. yes you, yeah. do. you pulled that right up yeah i i will say that there are a lot of people who foia for work so I, i've been involved with um a number of construction and bidding projects at the university and they time the um they time the way those bids are put in such that um usually the competition can't FOIA it. So you can FOIA the bid that some developer or somebody else put in for an RFP, and they will do that to each other in the hopes of figuring out what they're offering. So often they will, they will structure their timing thinking that they will you know, try to avoid FOIA when, when they're doing that. Um, so, which is kind of interesting to watch them do. And you're subject to FOIA, Aaron, because you work for a public institution. Oh, uh, we we know this deeply. Um, so so you Aaron can't, works for MSU. Right, and, and I'm a physician. You can't FOIA my patient records um, because those are covered by other confidentiality agreements. And there are limits to what you can FOIA about students. 
But we used to think that personnel records for years and years at the university, we thought personnel records were not foiable. And then the Nasser events happened and it became very clear that they are foiable. Um, and none of us know quite um, how to think about that. I think sometimes it probably is um, not good for us that those can be FOIA'd because people are more careful of what, about what they say in writing. Um, but you, you can FOIA that kind of stuff pretty clearly. So there's another question. Um, Kara's asking, how can someone go about getting FOIA fees waived or do you have to pay if you want the documents? So most documents will, most FOIA requests, there will be no charge. Most of them are straightforward and there will be simply no charge. If there is a charge, it's often very small. The way that you can get fees waived is to basically make a plea that says that you're doing it in the public interest and then they have sort of an option to not charge you. The other way you can get it waived is if you go to somebody who has the authority to basically pull the information for you and hand it to you without the FOIA system. So for example, we have on occasion asked city council to pull something for us after the city has said they wanna charge us for something. But for most FOIA requests, they're small enough that in fact the agency, um, you're dealing with cannot charge you. There are rules in the laws about how much time they have to have to put into something or how many copies they have to make before they can start charging you. So in general, you can get stuff without being charged. The other thing to know is that if a big charge comes in, one option is to do that request where you go in and look at it yourself. And if you do that, then they can't charge you for the copies, obviously, because they're not making copies of everything. So if you run into that problem, be in touch with us and we'll help you figure out how to get around the fees but often you will not get charged anything. Um, MSU actually charges pretty steadily, but it's kind of pennies, it's not very much. Uh, City of East Lansing generally doesn't charge unless we request something very large. So I have a follow-up question, Alice. So given the pandemic, are you able to go in now and look or is that off the table now? I believe at the current moment, because City Hall is closed oh. again, that for the next three weeks, we would not be able to go in and look at material. Although that said, if, if there was a, something that we could make a case that there was urgent and we needed to see it, they, they would, I think, set up a system by which we could go in and see it in a safe fashion if we made a special case for it. Yep. But there's very little for which I would take that risk for the other person or myself at this That's point. That's what makes sense. So we have another question from um, Faison. If information is redacted, first, can you challenge their grounds for redacting it? And second, can you seek additional information that was not redacted um, but not provided either. Andrew or Emily or Cody, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about, um, I'll actually talk about the second one first because that came up in a couple recent ones with us of the, the fire department FOIA um, where basically we weren't given an official response at any point. And when we were finally got the documents and records, we didn't get a cover letter. And the cover letter is, pretty critical to the process because it basically is supposed to say your request was approved, denied, and then, you know, if it was approved, here are the redactions, here's, you know, what was included, and like very, very clearly spelling out what you are and are not getting. Um, so if you, if there was information that wasn't provided, they, sh it basically, they didn't fulfill the request then for whatever reason. If it's redacted, there's some reason, and I believe there is a a process for appealing that I'm not I'm not less familiar with that but basically your request should be completed entirely and if information's not in there they should tell you why or that like it wasn't included in the request and then you can usually just file a different FOIA to try and get after that information specifically so then what about challenging the grounds for redaction? Anyone I'll, I'll answer that? I'll pass that to Alice. You can do that yes you can do that in an appeal and the appeal, typically when they give you back a FOIA, if it says granted, that basically means that they're giving you everything they claim they've found on that particular item. If it says partial, then they're going to include an explanation of what they've left out and under what exemption. That's the way they're supposed to do it. The East Lansing Fire Department, for example, doesn't do it correctly. The East Lansing Public Schools, in my experience, does it very strangely. They should use their lawyer more. But the city of East Lansing, for example, will tell you what they're redacting and for what reason in theory. And then they're gonna give you information on how you can appeal. And basically the way the policy currently works, you appeal to the mayor. 
So then you write to the mayor and you give the information. You can say in very plain language, I believe that they did not give me what I was owed and here is the reason. You can also appeal the fees the same way. And then the mayor has, I think, 10 business days to answer you. So by that point, you're getting into two months. So it can take a long time if there's an appeal um, process. And if you're not happy with the appeal, then you can sue. And it's not too difficult to sue in East Lance, uh, sorry, the state of Michigan under FOIA, but you probably want to have a lawyer if you're doing it. And usually lawyers um, will take the case if they think that it's an egregious case and they can get their fees paid because if the city or whoever it is loses the case, they have to pay the fees for your attorney. Got and it. a lot of attorneys will basically do it for free if they think it's a sure bet because they'll get the attorney fees through the agency. So several more questions have come in. So I'm going to just uh, pose them and then um, we'll decide who's going to answer. So B's asking, if you're shown copies of records, can you use your phone to make your own copies? Yes, you can use your phone. You can use a camera. You can, un in theory, even bring a photocopier with you if you want. Okay. It's also often the case that they'll have a photocopier there. And if you simply ask, can you copy the following four pages for me, they'll simply make the copy on the spot. So yes, you are absolutely allowed to make copies using whatever photographic system you want to use. Perfect. Um, so Chris is asking, do you know of any case where an East Lansing Commission used FOIA to get relevant, relevant information? I don't know of any cases, but they certainly have the right to do so. Everyone has the right to use FOIA. So the city manager can actually FOIA the city of East Lansing if he wants to do that. Anybody can use FOIA. So there's nothing stopping a commissioner on behalf of a commission FOIAing something. Okay. Um, and then Aaron is asking, how much of this is specific to the Michigan FOIA law? And is Michigan different than other states? There are states with much more generous laws and there are states with stricter laws. So we're talking largely about the Michigan law here. Um, and if you Google Michigan FOIA law, you'll find a lot of uh, legal firms giving you advice on what you can and can't do and how to word things. But again, we're always happy to help people. But we're talking largely specifically about the way the Michigan FOIA law works. There are some states that are better and there are some states that are much worse. So some states, for example, allow far longer delays than Michigan um, allows. I to interject, not about the law, but response rate. I know, I guess it was sometime in winter or spring 2019. At that point, I was commuting to and from Grand Rapids and I caught stateside every day and they had a special about how Michigan had one of the worst response rates for FOIA, I think at the state level. The state level, yes. yes. Yeah, the city actually does pretty well. The, the East Lansing Public Schools, in my experience, does very well in terms of speed of response. CADA, I've gotten fast responses back. Um, depends on the agency. So I have a question. This is Jody. So if I, as an individual, wanted to FOIA something that would benefit, knowing would benefit me personally, so there's no like business reason, there's no organizational reason, I just want to know something, is that allowable? Yeah, there's no limit to why you can FOIA something. If, if they're going to charge you, you'll have a harder time making the claim that you're doing it in the interest of the public good. So there, Aaron mentioned companies FOIA stuff for um, professional corporate reasons. There's a company, for example, that FOIAs all building permits because they then consolidate all building permit information and sell that information to other um, companies interested in building permit information, for example, tracking how many building permits are being done, what kind of building permits, who's doing building, et cetera, et cetera. Those companies would have a difficult time making the case that what they're doing is in the public good because what they're really doing it is in the interest of profit, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not in the public good in the way that Eli's reporting is in the public good. So yeah, you can FOIA whatever you want. Um, I, I personally find when there's not a pandemic, one of the most fun things you can do is actually go down to the building department and without FOIA, actually ask for the files on different properties. You can look at your own house's records. You can look at the records of the houses next door to you, and you learn lots of stuff about why your property is the way it is, who built what around you, how the water flow happened, that kind of thing. You absolutely can do stuff for whatever reason you have. Super helpful. Yeah, that makes sense. I found it really interesting because our house is an old house. It's a 1923 house. It was really helpful for me to go into the records of my own house and to try to understand what was changed when so that I could understand more, for example, about the electrical system. I could understand more about our plumbing system and these kinds of things. And it also had old photographs of our house 
that helped me understand what got built when. It was very, very, very interesting and very useful in terms of re rehabilitating our house. So in that case, you went where and requested what? In that case, I didn't use FOIA. I just went to the department of the building department in the city of East Lansing, which is on the second floor of um, City Hall, and simply requested the file. And I've done that for other properties as well for Eli reporting. So the building department records are supposed to be fairly open, simply on demand. Okay. So in those cases, it should be fairly easy to go in and simply say you want to see all of the property records for X property. And they're supposed to pretty much just turn it over to you. Lately, and then they, they pull asking, them for you and you sit in a room and look at them or you have yeah, to find them? You, you stand at the counter and look at it. And again, you can take photographs of whatever you want to take okay. in those cases. So yeah. Chris has a question. If you FOIA something that is very similar to something you FOIA'd before, what are the chances that you'll get a consistent response? For example, if you had to appeal the first time, are you more likely to get similar documents the next time? Nathan, do you want to take that one based on your experience, or would you like me to do that? <laughs> um, so I guess one thing I'll say is that there's been times where we've gotten a response from the city um, based on a request that's been submitted, and we'll get back X information, and then we can submit another request that essentially is looking for the same information, but we'll get slightly different information from the city. Um, I think part of it just has to be with who's collecting the data um, and then who's reviewing it before it's sent out. It, it does feel a little random sometimes. Um, you know, the people who work in whatever agency you're foying are human, and so it may be the case that whatever they're doing is dependent on a different person, a uh, different level of caffeination in terms <laughs> of how much they're paying attention. The way it's supposed to work, and it actually works correctly at MSU, and I know that because of my spouse, but also because of foying stuff from MSU. At MSU, the people who have the material turn it all over to the FOIA department, and the FOIA department decides what gets redacted, what's an appropriate response, in terms of what, what, what is responsive to the request and what should be withheld under which redaction. At the city of East Lansing, we've learned the hard way that individual workers within the city is ma are making choices about what to hold back. And they don't know the FOIA law well, and they don't know the FOIA responsiveness stuff, but also they have a personal interest sometimes in holding things back. So they're not supposed to be doing that. The clerk is supposed to be pulling everything and then making the decision based on the clerk's reading of the request and the law. But that's often not happening at the city, from what we can tell. So I have another question. This is Jody. So I guess I'm thinking as like a general average citizen in the city of East Lansing, I'm trying to think about what I might FOIA, like what might be interesting. So your example, Alice, of looking at your home, right, and seeing like what happened with your home. Um, I'm thinking I used to live in the Bailey neighborhood, and I'm thinking about there was one property where I was pretty sure they were renting it out, and it's it's a um, overlay district that's not allowed to rent. So in in hindsight, I'm thinking I wonder what I could have FOIA there, or when I think about parking tickets and who gets a ticket and who doesn't, I'm wondering what I could FOIA there. I'm wondering if you could just kind of talk broadly about what citizens could do and how and what they might do to kind of get information that would be, and those are just two examples. Sure, in the case of housing stuff, you could actually start with the housing administrator who's Annette Irwin and try to get information out of her, but there's no reason why you can't yourself FOIA all information about a particular house. For example, FOIA all the violations from that house. Um, and so I've done that with some student rental houses in order to have some understanding of uh, Sometimes just like how often has no, have noise complaints been put in so that when I, for example, go to the landlord, I can talk with them about a perpetual problem at a house and maybe trying to rent to people who are less problematic or whatever. So you can FOIA that stuff. Some of that stuff may need to come through the East Lansing Police Department and not the city of East Lansing. So one of the things you want to do is do a little bit of advanced work and figure out if you're FOIAing the right group. So is, are you asking stuff that the city has on records or are you asking stuff the police department has on records? They have separate records. And then <clears throat> in addition to that, some of what you may be interested in is actually 911 dispatch records. And so the county dispatch 911 system has its own FOIA system where you can also get information there for how often calls have been made. So there may, for example, be a rental house that has a lot of calls on it, but the police are not actually writing the tickets. In that case, you can FOIA the 911 records to figure out how often complaints are being made 
which is different from how often are tickets being written. So that's sort of how you could approach that kind of stuff. As far as parking tickets goes, again, that's usually East Lansing police, um, although the city may have some of the records on that stuff. So you wanna just check in advance and see what kinds of stuff you can um, find out about that. But um, beyond that, you know, you can, you can use it to find out other kinds of information. So for example, um, say you just wanted to kind of figure out how the city is managing some particular issue that's of concern to your neighborhood. You could FOIA communications about that issue within the city of East Lansing. And so you'll get back people's emails back and forth in terms of them talking about that stuff. So one thing to realize is that when you're writing into the city, you may be putting yourself in the position of having your own material FOIA because your communications to your government are part of the government record. And so that's one of those things where, again, if, if you're in a position where you feel like you want us to file a FOIA request for you, we do that for people lots of times in order to make sure that folks um, have coverage from awkward situations if they want to have coverage from them. But so, for example, some, some people don't realize that when they call 911 dispatch and they give their name and everything, that's all part of a public record that ultimately could be FOIA if somebody wanted to bother. Yeah, I General think, drunken frat boys don't want to find out who called them because uh -huh. they don't want to file a FOIA request. So it's safe to call. I think about it a lot of the, the sense of FOIA is kind of more of like a tool for you to, to cut in and get the information you want. So think about it more in the guise of what do you want to know? And then think about what records it like contain that information. Because that's basically what FOIA allows is like Alice talked about at the beginning is sort of any information that might be kept by city government, Department of Public Works, whatever, um, is as a you know tax paying citizen is your right to access that and know what your government's doing. So it's it's sort of hard to say like, well, these are all the things you can FOIA and these are all the things you can't FOIA because it's also sort of gray about what might get exempted, what might get redacted too. And you know, you can go to court, but to think of it more of, I wanna know this and then ask, can I have these records that would tell me this? There's also material that can legally be destroyed after a certain amount of time. So we've learned this, for example, with the East Lansing Police Department with regard to complaints against officers only have to be kept for two years in terms of the records. So there are things that will be destroyed after some period of time. And so we, we do lose public records all the time. Emily, you're somebody who has a PhD in history and you've done work in archives. What's the difference for you in terms of the experience of working in an archive versus filing a FOIA request? Well, I guess the pleasure is I get to do this in English, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Instead of Russian. Yeah. Um, there are some similarities. Um, even when I have tried to look for things in the Soviet Union archives, so they're in Russia today, but they were documents dating from the 70s when it was still the Soviet Union, there's privacy law. So they weren't willing to give me names, addresses, because they have this log that they let me see once. And it was people who moved to Moscow and then within, and it was like this gold mine, and my dissertation was gonna be like based on it. And they said, we can't just give you these people's information. I was like, I could see the flip side, like a headline in the United States, like Russian agents have access to your address. So I understood. So there's that arbitrary nature. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think FOIA though, you have to be a bit more imaginative at least because you don't know what's there. You have an idea, and the more I've been with Eli, the more I have an idea. But when you go to an archive, there's descriptions. Um, and even though sometimes there was a little bit of concern in Russian archives about handing information over to foreigners and how that might be used and abused when they publish their own scholarship, more or less, they're very enthusiastic about helping you find the documents. And I often had the archivist like, you didn't ask for this, but here it is. Like I met, made Yvonne go get this for you, where maybe it's also because I've done this online. I haven't felt that we've been helped. I felt we've often been hindered with the city documents. And that's kind of a sad, unfortunate reality that in Moscow, they've been more helpful. <laughs> that's a good fundraising. Jody, throw that thing up again. <laughs> I'm in the middle of doing it right now. 
Well, great. We do have just a couple minutes left before eight o'clock. Does anybody else have any uh, comments or uh, questions? Any of the students want to ask any questions or ask for any help with any projects you're doing? So the, I, only, thing, the only thing I wanted to say just real quickly is um, Cody and Emily and others have dropped in the chat, which will be saved. So maybe we can send that out to everybody. Um, places where you can look things up, like the register of actions and property records and things like that, which is really helpful. Yeah, Jody, I'm thinking we can put the recording and the chat up at the um, page where we announce this and just do an update on it and provide Perfect. it to everybody. Yep. The register of actions too, I think you have to look by name or license plate, but it is like you could go look up the parking tickets I racked up as a grad student if you wanted to. I personally found it fun because I had to go through it for a story I was writing. Mark Rebner pointed out its existence to me. So there's other court cases, any litigation with the city. So then I looked up Ben's, my boyfriend's, and I'm like, oh, you backed up into that car in 2009? Like, what happened there? And then we found out about different family members who also were egregious parking violators, so. So if you can't get together with your family for Thanksgiving, you can at least torture them by looking up their parking ticket yeah. records <laughs> for the family Zoom. Email your uncle that. that mug shot. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming. And we really appreciate you being with us. Um, and again, feel free to be in touch with us if you need any help. It's super easy to do. Just go to eastlansinginfo.news slash contact or a contact form in any case. On the website, you'll find the contact button and you can be in touch with us and one of us will get back in touch with you. Um, thanks all for coming. And if you have a couple bucks to throw our way, hit that donate button at the website and help us out because we've got matching funds. Thank you. And, and, and if you can't, then at least like us on social or share our website or um, share what you've learned tonight through social. That'd be great. Now we all say it together. Podcast. Teamwork makes the dream, dream work. work. <laughs> favorite. Awesome. Great. Thanks, well, thanks everyone. Thanks, for guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.